From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador, I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. Today marks the one-year anniversary of the murder of Rio de Janeiro Councilwoman Mariel Franco. Citizens in Rio paid tribute to Mariel on the same street where she and her driver, Anderson Gomez, were gunned down. She's remembered for being a fearless defender of human rights, as well as the rights of Afro-Brazilians and the LGBTI community. The anniversary comes two days after Brazilian police arrested two former military police officers in connection with her murder. 400 women from the landless workers movement in Brazil occupied train tracks used by mining company Vale. But police violently broke up the protests using tear gas and rubber bullets in order to make sure the Vale trains would not be delayed. At least 10 demonstrators were injured, most of them older women. In January, a dam owned by the Vale mining company burst, killing at least 200 people. Our correspondent Ignacio Lemus was at the protest in Sarcedo. We are here at the train tracks that the Vale Company uses to move its goods to other countries. Women belongings to the MST are condemning Vale and its practices. Almost 400 women have joined together to say Bell continues to commit environmental crimes with impunity. In January, in the municipality of Rumandino, a dam belonging to Bell broke, killing 200 people. Right now, we are nearby Brumadinho, and it's another dangerous area with dams. These protests are also taking place on March 14 in remembrance of the one-year anniversary of the murder of Councilwoman Mariel Franco, and come as part of a number of demonstrations that MST women have held starting on International Women's Day. Over 800 women from the Landless Workers Movement in Brazil occupied one of the farms owned by the medium, Joao de Duas, who has been accused of sexual abuse and violence against around 500 women and jailed since December 2018. We are in one of the many areas of land owned by Joao de Deus. He is accused of exerting violence against many women during his sessions, so we have come here to denounce his abuse and we want his lands to be given over to the agrarian reform. We also want victims to be recognized and compensated. This year, we are also mobilizing on a national level against the reform promoted by the president. All Capistan women and all working women are standing up against this reform. That clearly goes against this. It's also a special date because of the anniversary of the mother of our comrade, Mariere Franco. From the farm down in Nacio, in Annapolis, in the state of Goiás, they remember the human rights activist, Mario Franco, and urge the clarification of the murder last March 14, 2018, and who promoted that political crime. They also criticize the machista view and the backtracking by the current government, the increase in femicides and attacks against agrarian reform. We are going through a really tricky political moment. We have two governments, one that does not accept this kind of protest, and we have a president that also rejects the landless workers movement. This is a great challenge for us, entering this farm as a conquest. We don't know where all this money comes from, all this abuse against women, and all of the oppression that women continue to suffer. Our occupation, our protest, is a sign that we are fighting for our rights. We demand that the women are respected. Another struggle is agrarian reform. We know how important a her own land is for a woman and her family. In Brazil, the country with the fifth highest number of women being violently killed, they are protesting against misery and inequality. They are calling for the end of the patriarchy. We stay in Brazil. A religious service has been held for six of the victims of Wednesday's school shooting in Susano. Family and friends gather in a municipal sports center to pay their respects to those who were killed. It is difficult because when I was younger, I worked in that school. I studied at that school. I worked in the kitchen of that school. We never imagined that something like this could have happened and right there next to our home, where we live, where we practically know everyone and share with all of these kids. We have never seen anything like this happen here. Sadly, the situation in our country is difficult. And 10 people were killed in the shooting, mostly school children. 
These are the images of the school when it happened. Police say it was carried out by the two former students of the school who then killed themselves. Investigators believe it was inspired by the 1999 Columbine massacre in the United States. And a vigil was held Wednesday night at the school. People came together to remember the victims with a religious service. It's with much pain, with much sadness. I think that no one expects this from a young person. Young people should be spending their energy studying, playing sports, not these things. Much sadness, much pain. I think that this act didn't only hurt the victims, but it hurt society, it hurt our city, it hurt Brazil. Everyone is feeling this. Authorities in Nigeria have called off the search for survivors after a building collapsed in Lagos Island. The building housed a primary school and nursery. It came down with a warning Wednesday morning, killing at least 10 people. At least 37 people were rescued alive, and it's believed more than 100 students were in the three-story building when it came down. The governor of Lagos says the school was operating illegally. He blamed the landlord for resisting the government's demolition plan. This very school, they've already asked them to renovate, to vacate from that building. So they're remarking. It's a government that's taking bread from the lungs. So that's why they return the, the building there. So how that happen? It's fed from the outside, from the government. You understand? Because we that are living here, we don't have the power to go there and demolish it. It's a government. Venezuela has condemned the decision by Ecuador to pull out of the South American regional bloc UNASUR. On Wednesday night, the Ecuadorian president, Lenin Moreno, went on TV to claim that, he, that the body had ceased to have a function and blame what he called the vices of 20th century socialism. He also said his government would remove the statue of the former Argentinian president, Néstor Kirchner, located in the building in Quito, who was the first secretary general of UNASUR. We will no longer participate in any other organization's activities. We will not allocate one more cent, nor additional contribution to the organization's budget. We have begun the internal proceedings to officially leave the UNASUR Treaty. In response, Venezuela's foreign minister, Jorge Arias, tweeted a quote from Latin America's independence leader, Simón Bolívar. It said, we cannot have traitors in our ranks, otherwise we would lose our great homeland. Simón Bolívar led the first unification of Latin American nations in the 19th century. The government of Venezuela has announced electricity has been fully restored across the country. The Caracas metro is fully functional again, as people have returned to work. Communication Minister Jorge Rodriguez said the government has overcome cyber and sabotage attacks on its power system, which began last Thursday. He added that drinkable water has also been restored to 80% of the country. Let's take a look at the streets of Caracas after this massive power outage. Quiet streets. Calls for peace continue to resonate. Here in the neighborhoods, we want peace for our communities. We don't want war in better wars. We want peace and we want wholeheartedly support our president, Nicolás Maduro. With dark days behind them, the people look ahead. Their resilience shines through as they overcome adversity with a smile. Regardless of our political position, it's important to think about who was attacking us, President Nicolás Maduro or the opposition and the lackeys of the empire. Empire. It's important to remember who is bringing electricity and water back, President Nicolás Maduro. It's evident that there's a social struggle in various corners of Caracas. The defense of the Bolivarian Revolution is strengthened by every community's achievement. Here they took electricity, water and food away from us. We are going to continue with a peaceful and participatory revolution. Always loyal, never traitors. As infrastructure and social programs continue to be attacked, contingency plans are being put in place with the participation of citizens who are on the front lines of the resistance. We'll take a short break now. Don't go away.
The Pakistani journalist Tariq Ali examines the mass media influence promoted by imperialism. Get access to the analysis of the socio-economic and political life of the whole South America on our screen and platform in English. A critical place committed to the truth to determine the major events that transform the world today. On Monday, only on Venezuela. Para mantenerme saludable, yo corro. To keep myself healthy, I study. Ya nadie te hizo y es teléfono asustar. Para mantenerme saludable, yo bailo. Para mantenerme saludable, yo purifico mi espíritu a través del cuerpo. ¿Y tú? Get your body. Tuesdays, only on LSU. Welcome back. Human rights organizations in Guatemala are worried about recent cases of lynching towards alleged criminals. They say it shows the state is not providing security and justice to the population. The human rights organization Mutual Support has published a report on lynchings in Guatemala with alarming figures. In the last 10 years, the country has seen 1,656 incidents in which 360 people were killed and there have been more lynchings in 2019. In 2019, just in January, there were already four lynchings and eight more in February. But the report was prepared in January and it only deals with those four lynchings. Two happened in Esquintla, one in Quetzaltenango and another in Weiweitenango. The report states that people chose to lynch criminals because they're fed up that the police are not doing their job and arresting those who commit crimes. Other cases are linked to extortion and sexual abuse. The failure of the state to guarantee justice has led to the increase in lynchings, the report states. We are really worried because this shows Guatemala as a violent country where problems are not resolved by the institutions. There is a complete lack of trust in public institutions, especially the police and the justice system. Researchers say that for many years people believed that lynchings only happened in indigenous communities of the interior of the country. However, last year, the central region, including the capital, saw many lynchings. In this region, crime figures remain the same compared with other regions where lynchings have reduced the level of crime. We can see that in most of the country where homicides take place, there are no lynchings. But where there are lynchings, there are no homicides either. Only two districts have both kinds of violence. The Department of Guatemala has a high murder rate of 54 for every 100,000 inhabitants. And it was also reported that in 2018, there were 15 lynchings. The demand from human rights activists is for the state to assume its role in guaranteeing justice and security. Because if it doesn't, lynchings will continue, with furious citizens supposedly taking justice into their own hands, but in fact committing brutal crimes themselves. Trinidad and Tobago's Prime Minister can breathe a sigh of relief after medical tests prove that he has no need for heart surgery. Keith Rowley posted a photo of himself and his doctor in the U.S. as he shared the news on social media. The PM left for the U.S. last week for coronary testing. He'll remain under observation for a few more days before returning home. In 2016, while undergoing pro prostate cancer screening, Rowley also underwent coronary testing that revealed soft plaque in one of his arteries. 
also in TNT, biodegradable and eco-friendly packaging for the food and beverage industry will be exempt from customs duties for the next two years. The move coincides with the decision to ban the importation and use of styrofoam packaging this year. The government says the ban would be implemented once the required customs codes are finalized. Jamaica's government is placing greater focus on gender issues and has allocated close to $70 million to purchase property for women's shelters. Two additional fa facilities for abused women are to be established as well. You would have heard um, of resources allocated for two additional centers to assist women who find themselves in situations of conflict or situation um, in which they are being abused. We had allocated resources to build one last year and now we've allocated resources for an additional two. Now to Grenada. The government has launched an investigation into a company that benefited from the island's citizenship by investment program. The company called Grenada Sustainable Aqu Aquaculture failed to deliver on a state-of-the-art shrimp farm. Prime Minister Keith Mitchell says the government is seeking regional and international support to deal with proprietors as they collected significant sums of money. The U.S. Federal Aviation Administration decided to ground all Boeing 737 MAX 8 jets until further notice, and it has caused distress at some Caribbean airports. At least one American Airlines model at Trinidad's Piarco International Airport is unable to leave the country. And in Barbados, dozens of American Airlines passengers were also left in shambles after MAX 8 flights were canceled. The European Union has added five more Caribbean countries to its tax haven blacklist, and CARICOM isn't happy about it. Barbados, Bermuda, Aruba, Belize, and Dominica failed to make specific commitments to adapt their tax rules and practices according to EU standards. However, CARICOM's Secretary General Irwin Rock says many of the countries are compliant according to relevant regulatory authorities. CARICOM leaders say the EU blacklisting has brought considerable damage to the community. Now to Bolivia, the central bank says it will maintain its own policies, which have been so far a major success for the country to come. Let's find out more. The Central Bank of Bolivia implemented the counter-cyclical policy. What it means is that the government manages the economy so that the prices of raw materials don't drop and spending is reduced. In times of global economic contraction, we have expanded credit and a policy for reducing interest rates. Adapting measures that go against the norm of economics has proven to be successful for the Bolivian economy. The exchange rate has remained stable, which without doubt favored expansionary policies by generating lower inflation. All of this is contrary to what has been happening to other economies. Because of its counter-cyclical policy, Bolivia is expected to lead in economic performance in the region this year like it has done for the last five years. We will continue fighting against the adverse effects of economy cycles to avoid undermining our economy. We want to avoid employment and depriving families. A stable exchange rate will persist. We at the central bank are confident about this. In 2019, experts estimate that the country's GDP will grow by over 4.5% because of a nearly $8 billion state investment. More than 100 people have died as flash floods ravaged Mozambique and Malawi. Thousands of people have been displaced. Villages are underwater. Power has been knocked out and so has the water supplies in some places. Mozambique officials have declared a red alert due to the continuing rains and the approach of the tropical cyclone Idai. Malawi's president declared a state of disaster last week. 
Kenyan women have expressed outrage over the always brand sanitary pads, saying they cause rashes, burns, and discomfort. Using the Twitter hashtag MyAlwaysExperience, they have condemned the brand, suggesting that a cheaper version of the product is sold in Africa. Several groups in Zambia and South Africa have also begun protesting over this. We have more stories coming up. We'll be back. The life is full of moments. Moments of fight. Moments of hope. Moments that transcend. Moments that you can live in. Telezur documentaries. Sundays. Only on Telezur. Discover the cultural diversity that defines a continent. The place where art and tradition are part of the same nucleus. Artistic expressions. Values. Fridays, only on the resort. Welcome back. In the UK, only one former soldier will be prosecuted in connection to the deaths of civil rights protesters in Northern Ireland more than 40 years ago. The incident on January 30, 1972 in, in London Dairy is known as Bloody Sunday. British troops opened fire during a march where unarmed people were protesting Britain's detention of suspected Irish nationalists. They killed 13 people and wounded 14 others. The soldier who will be prosecuted is identified only as Soldier F. He will be charged with two murders and four attempted murders. In respect of the other suspects reported to us by police, including 16 former soldiers and two alleged official IRA members, it has been concluded that the available evidence is insufficient to provide a reasonable prospect of conviction. In these circumstances, the evidential test for prosecution is not met and decisions not to prosecute have been taken in respect of the remaining 18 individuals reported by police. Good morning. Today's decision, although 47 years overdue, is the right one. If we are to uphold the rule of law, and hold perpetrators accountable for their crimes. However, we also say that the scope of the new police investigation was not wide enough. And we assert that the repeated failure to properly investigate the actions of those who planted nail bombs on the body of my uncle, 17-year-old Jared Donaghy, is unacceptable. The Savile report left a stain on Jared's innocence that, a, that this investigation could have removed, but it did not do so. We repeat our call for this injustice to be addressed. 
European Council President Donald Tusk is to ask EU leaders to be open to a long Brexit extension. In a tweet, Tusk suggests that this may be necessary if the UK needs more time to reassess its strategy of leaving the EU. EU leaders are scheduled to meet on March 21st to discuss Brexit. The black boxes from the crash Ethiopian plane have arrived in France. The flight data recorder and cockpit voice are critical for the case and will be handed over to France, to the Air Accident Investigation Agency. This as authorities work to find out why the brand new aircraft plunged to the ground shortly after taking off, killing the 157 people on board. A pipeline explosion in Iran has killed at least four people and injured six. A woman and a young child are among the dead. A gas leakage in the pipeline connecting the gas network from the city of Avaz to Mashahar is said to have caused the blast. Fire officials fear the death toll could rise. Over a hundred schools have been closed in Malaysia and hundreds of people are still sick after toxic waste was dumped into a river last week. This happened near the industrial town of Parsir Gudang in southern Johor state close to the border with Singapore. Authorities say three men have been arrested for the dumping, which sent hazardous fumes into the air. It's unclear what poisonous gas was emitted, but patients are displaying symptoms of vomiting and nausea. With that, we come to the end of this news brief, but you can find these and many other stories by going to our website, telesurenglish.net. For our viewers in Africa, you can find us on Starsat Channel 461 in South Africa and Channel 539 in Nigeria. And you can join us on social media. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.